all, I'd like to thank everyone for coming to this second annual Daniel Katie Day event um, to celebrate uh, the life and the poetry of Daniel Katie. Um, so thank you for joining us. And um, I'm going to be introducing Marianne Boyce, who will be making introductions with Daniel Katie. Thank you, Jen. We are about to travel back in time from 2014 to 1931. Dr. Daniel L. Cady, born and raised here in West Windsor, is our esteemed guest this afternoon, and he's no stranger to this community. While his professional career was in the practice of law in New York City, Dr. Cady is best known for his wonderful poetry of rural Vermont life. He will be reading a few of his po favorite poems for us, and perhaps a little commentary in between. Please welcome Dr. Daniel Levins Cady. <laughs> Thank you, and a pleasure as always to be in my hometown, although I have to admit I don't know very many people nowadays, but I still come back here. Ah, boy, but the lingering winter that we have had still chills on the lap of May a little, at least up our way in Burlington where I live. I do not think it very nice of old Mr. Winter to sit so long in the lap of little Miss May. It reminds me of what happened when the sitting situation was reversed. There was a young maid named Miss Pease who sat on her best fellow's knees. He let her fall through and she broke, it is true, the engagement. That's all, if you please. <laughs> now, do you think her justified or should she have done even more to the careless cuss? Well, even with the winter we've had, we've had over 700 tulips in our garden up in Burlington. We have a gardener who delights in his work we are just envious of, especially now the yellow roses are going to be coming pretty soon, and I claim all the yellow ones as my own. Well, I can remember being here, it was just about 15 years ago, in 1916, when we dedicated Story Memorial Hall. And I uh, wrote this poem, which the uh, local paper referred to as an effusion, but um, I think it is uh, tastefully done, reasonably, called West Windsor's Hour Has Struck, which I delivered on that day, October 27th, 1916. This little town where we were born and where in heart we still reside at length beholds a glorious morn, a day of brick and mortar pride. Goodwill's fair fruit today we pluck, our satisfaction weighs a ton. West Windsor's hour at last has struck, she takes her station in the sun. The western parish, long delayed, now comes into her rightful own. No longer dinged at or and dismayed, she walks, she runs, she flies alone. She has at length some heartland luck? Not much. Her innings have begun. West Windsor's hour at last has struck. She takes her station in the sun. Her civil board now has its wish, an office with a hardwood floor. Can Andover or Cavendish beat that? Or baby Baltimore? The Pomfret folks indeed may duck. The Stockbridge folks our splendor shun. Bridgewater knows our hour has struck. They see us standing in the sun. No more shall Windsor's classy street or Woodstock's jail anointed green look down upon us when we meet or Chester's tony frown be seen. Let Bethel's miners run amok. 
Let Norwich sob with Royalton. West Windsor's hour at last has struck. She takes her station in the sun. The Weathersfieldian bow may break, the shapely shaft at Sharon fall, and Plymouth Kingdom's corners shake, but not the corners of this hall. Let witty Redding's jokesmiths pluck their jokes and try our kind of fun. West Windsor's hour has also struck. She stands resplendent in the sun. We fear not Springfield's wealthy roar, nor Hartford's everlasting smudge. Let Barnard keep her golden oar, and Ludlow keep the probate judge. Let Rochester and Weston cluck and see how fast their chickens run. West Windsor's crowning hour has struck. She steps into the noonday sun. We magnify his name, who gave these well-built walls and graceful tower, this civic home where banners wave, which autumn's later blooms embower. It might have been arranged by Puck, so tastefully has all been done. Tis plain West Windsor's hour was struck. She sails into distinction's sun. We welcome heartily today our neighbors lesser blessed than we, and all who come from far away, our townhouse and ourselves to see. Forget my muse that oft gets stuck, these strains of verbal burlap spun, but not this town whose hour has struck, this hall that greets the morning sun. Now, thank you. Of course, there weren't as uh, not as many people here today as there was when I uh, re read that back uh, 15 years ago. There were about 600 people at that particular ceremony, but but it, does, it is quality, not quantity. So, <laughs> and I think this uh, building would have a very hard time with that many people. Now. Uh, Time was that when a person could become famous by simply traveling, when a person simply by going far and returning became noted and famed, although he never did anything else. Now, no doubt this was due in some measure to the wonderful sights that the travelers saw and the accounts they gave of their experiences. For instance, Herodotus, the father of history, noted down many an Egyptian fact that wasn't so, to use the words of my old professor, Petty. The Greeks that penetrated westward beyond the pillars of Hercules came back with full information about the sinking of the continent of Atlantis, although they arrived there just too late to see it sink. The Latins who visited the mountains in northern Africa swore that they scraped the moon, hence their name. But I tell you, no matter how far that I go, I have very fond memories of growing up here. I, of course, uh, my boyhood home, just up at the top of the hill in the brick house, but I was actually born on the western slopes of Mount Escutney on uh, what uh, we used to call in my time the West Weathersfield Road. And uh, I wrote this particular piece, which I consider one of the nicest pieces that uh, I ever wrote, called Coming Long in Vermont. The time that we lived there on the road that plumbed the Pearson Peak Divide and worked the farm Great Grandpa cleared, which run clear up a Scutney side, the nicest folks would come along, the nicest folks year after year, and you can, can't make me say that I'm wrong, although they acted kind of queer. Come, Happy Smith, for old time's sake, I want to hear your mellow song. Come, Lovecraft Ann and old Levake, I want to see you come along. They didn't have no hoss or cart. 
They hoofed it as if it was a treat. But where they came from, where they went, we never asked about their beat. The, we never missed a thing, not one, and yet we sort of watched them too. For they had eyes that beat a gun for shooting right straight into you. Old Happy Smith had books and soap. I've seen a Scottish chief's today we got from him in 56, and it's too good to throw away. A shaving box, let me add, he gave me once of shiny tin. The only box I've ever had to put my little playthings in. He liked our house for Sabbath stops, and in the evening I declare he'd find some schoolhouse door unlocked and start a gospel meeting there. My gracious, how that smith could sing! It shook the desks, and how his face would lighten up like everything, the only candle in the place. Come, happy smith, for old time's sake, I want to hear your saintly song. Come, love cracked Anne and old Levake, I want to see you come along. Old love cracked Anne, she'd warm a mug of cider in the fireplace coals and eat it with some Johnny cake. Then wash the floor, or card some rolls, she never sponged. And then she'd show her engagement rings, one, two, and three. <laughs> and tell about a grand bateau, and dark man bounding o'er the sea. And old Levake of Latin blood, or maybe Injun gone astray, he always paid for what he had by mending baskets half a day. His head and hands was full of snap. He fixed the clock once so it would run, then took his shilling, raised his cap, and trudged into the setting sun. Come, happy smith, for old time's sake, I want to hear your happy song. Come, love cracked Anne and old Levake, I want to see you come along. Thank you, thank you. I don't remember getting as much applause last year, so I must be improving in my older years. I shall now take great pleasure in sharing with you a poem I wrote about Vermont Covered Bridges at the suggestion of Daniel Willard, who is president of both the B&O Railroad and John Hopkins Hospital. Daniel Willard is an old friend who uh, was born in Heartland and began life by firing an engine on the Pasumpsic Railroad. It was he who set me on to write a piece on covered bridges. Now he says they are the greatest places for courting ever. <laughs> now there is a reference in here to Black Hawk, which you may or may not be aware. Black Hawk was in fact a celebrated Vermont stallion, the sire of many fine Morgan colts in days agone. Will Shakespeare told of kings and queens, and swift upon a wager, rid up a broomstick, and they say he'd done it like a major. Rossetti, in his damozel, branched off to mention midges, but Daniel Willard wants a piece that deals with covered bridges. <laughs> well, Daniel ought to have his way, whatever be the sequel. You'll travel more than eight hours a day before you'll find his equal. Too bad he left our green-faced hills for blue and other ridges. He should have stayed right here to home amongst the covered bridges. They're true and beautiful and good and bring thoughts of Hellas. No wonder that the hatless bridge gets fidgety and jealous. I like a bridge that sports a roof, well thatched with cedar shingle. They're just as good for married folks and better for the single. For where may country lad and lass, their workday world forgetting, have better chance for holding hands and altruistic petting? No logia is like the place where some loose boarding bellies 
through which to look on Luna's face and quote an ode of Shelley's. They're always where they ought to be, above the falls or below them. But strange, the laziest man in town is always hired to snow them. <laughs> the swimming hole nine times in ten is neat one end or the other. Them boys are sitting on the bank as sissies minding mother. The picture posts, posters stuck all through, they make a thrilling mixture. One day the curate asked my wife concerning Black Hawk's picture. Said he, I don't see why a hoss should have such advertising. Said wifey, lo the willows bend, I fear the wind is rising. <laughs> to plank em draws a caucus crowd, and when they're shingled thunder, the swain that slips and strikes the drink becomes a nine days wonder. They house you when a shower booms up, they shield the tramp and gypsy, and all that come and all that go, the temperate <coughs> and the tipsy. <coughs> it's fun to watch the way they're made, they wasn't built by grafters. The cords, the uprights, oak hewn pins, the ridge pole and the rafters. An iron bridge turns rusty red. A concrete bridge gets sooty. Give me an old covered bridge for business, love, or beauty. <laughs> Now, of course, I, uh, I am very flattered. I am always quoted from my uh, Rhymes of Vermont Rural Life series, but of course, I did publish two books prior to that. And uh, uh, my next, my last two are going to be uh, from those. This one is from Maize and Milkweed, 52 Stocks, which was published in 1916, called How Did It Happen? Dear friend, kind friend, in most affairs your judgment stands alone. I would take your word six days a week as quickly as my own. Your wits are hard as bone, and so I'm stumped to know what t'was that carried you so far. What in creation made you buy that awful kind of car? <laughs> Was you stampeded by the man who used to sell the line? Or did you agree to buy the tent before you looked at number nine? Or did you ask Lou Pine? What mental process did you use and was it up to par? Just tell us what it all possessed made you select that car. Did you flip a coin or read some movie magazine? Or how in thunder did you come to purchase that machine? Or did you ask Joe Beam? Was you hard sick when you was young? Or younger than you are? Give us a reason, if you can, for picking out that car. <laughs> what kind of transcendental josh unsocketed your soul? What talking point pilled through your mind? and left an awful hole? Or did you ask Pete Dole? Was you a healthy youth, or does your headpiece bear a scar? Just tell us how your gray stuff worked when you picked out that car. You knew that there was other makes and other models, too. Was it the swell upholstery that turned the trick with you? Or did you ask Ab Drew? Was you in usual health that day, or suffering from Qatar? For land's sakes, tell us, if you can, just why you bought that car. <laughs> now, I know that there has been a stir, being this is 1931, and there's been a lot of activity on the hill, and I, of course, been in the process of having a mausoleum created, which I've been hearing some uh, rather unflattering remarks that I shall not 
repeat in this company, but uh, it is in a very prominent spot. It was a field, of course, where I uh, played as a boy. It's at least 500 feet above the center of town here in the village, and it can be seen for miles around, and so people will have to look up to me whether they want to or not. <laughs> Having said that, I will end with he builds too low who builds beneath the skies. <laughs> We're all too much in love with worldly good, which at last so little satisfies. We plan and build, forgetting all the while he builds too low who builds beneath the skies. We place our hopes in houses and in lands. We sail the seas with costly merchandise. But at the last, our voyaging ends in wreck. He builds too low, who builds beneath the skies. Too faithfully, we follow after fame and rest our hopes upon the rabble's cries. So sure to fail us in our hour of need, he builds too low who builds beneath the skies. Thank you very much. And uh, Mr. Katie has now uh, left the building, so to speak, um, and uh, I am myself once again, whoever that is, I have too many alter egos, uh, Adam Boyce last I knew. Um, so uh, I, there was an information sheet that uh, was out in case anybody doesn't already know or have heard about Daniel L. Katie, but are there questions or comments or anecdotes that people would like to share before we have some more poetry reading? You've all got a load enough, so you no. you know. Oh, yes. Do we know what his voice really sounded like? Is it a thicker or a similar accent? Unfortunately, I don't believe any uh, recordings exist uh -huh. of his. But I'm, I'm I hope maybe someday we'll find out. I'm I'm amazed he didn't have his voice recorded, but he knew, we know he did give speeches to a number of colleges <coughs> where he got honorary degrees, and uh, he did uh, well various uh, other institutions. He was in the Rotary, so he was accustomed to public speaking, and, and an attorney, of course, so he knew how to filibuster or uh, how, to, how to speak before there were such things as public address systems, so he must have had a reasonable voice. Other questions? Yes, sir. Adam, country boy that he was, he, he drove a, a distinctive car, did, did he not? He didn't actually drive, he was chauffeured. Uh -huh. Yes, he had a Rolls Royce. <laughs> and how did people take to that? Well, when he came to town, I don't think people liked it particularly well, and I think that may have colored the perception because he was also seen walking around in a drunken state, which I don't think was entirely true. Uh, he writes, around 1931, that he had been to every doctor from Boston to Baltimore, and there was some type of an inner ear disturbance, mm -hmm. which made people think mm -hmm. he probably was intoxicated. Now, he did drink, but I've seen no evidence where he got into brawls or that he was arrested, and he, a lot of uh, <coughs> pages and pages and boxes of things that he typed, wrote to various people, so, um, so I don't know. I mean, he, he invited people to um, little cocktail parties once in a while, or he would, uh, for fun, if they had a top hat, they could bring that along. So, eccentric, yes. I don't know if that was entirely deserved, but we know it was a Rolls Royce because he mentions after the 27 flood, their car was always stored at the Rolls Royce garage in Springfield, Massachusetts, and then they wintered in Florida. Um, so, and I'd have had the best reputation, but yes, he, he was a little full of himself, let's say. But a good attorney, 
would have to be. Yeah. If there are any attorneys here, I didn't mean that. <laughs> any, anybody? Yes. Well, you mentioned the uh, homestead and the road. Do those still exist? I, I think it's the same house. That's the end of what would be now Kimball Farm Road. Um, but it's been all redone over. It doesn't, I don't look, probably doesn't look the same as it did when he was born there. There were accounts that all he remembered were rats running across the, the kitchen floor. Um, but there was that poem coming along, so he did remember a few things beyond that. But the house up here at the top of the hill was the one that he most remember because at some point when he was at least five or six or seven they moved that was his maternal grandparents home it was Levin's house and they played of course down across the way in the beaver brook and then up where his mausoleum is now that was all cow pasture and so uh, they could you could look down on the village of Brownsville uh, he incidentally always said he was from West Windsor. He never considered himself in Brownsville, and they, but he could see Brownsville from his house. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, he graduated in 1886 with a PhD. What is that? Uh, philosophy. But the B stands for. I I have no idea. <laughs> okay. That that's what I came across. I don't. Yeah. But, but it, was, it was philosophy, then later he got honorary degrees from both the University of Vermont and Norwich University. But then somehow he studies law on his own, and four years later gets into the bar. So, yeah. But, uh, yes? When did, yeah. when did he leave West Windsor? To, did, and did he go to Burlington? Or what? In the eight, early 1880s, he went to Kimball Union Academy, and for about a year, and then he went to Montpelier Seminary, and then he went to UVM, uh, where he graduated in 1886. Yeah. But he didn't, uh, he didn't graduate from either KUA or Montpelier Seminary. Uh, he was only there for a year at KUA and maybe two years at Montpelier Seminary when he says some type of an epidemic or other broke out, and uh, I don't know, but he, I guess he did do some school teaching, but that was not his ultimate goal. And I don't know how he, he settled on the law, but uh, um, there's a lot of speculation, of course. He married a very wealthy widow, of course, in 1912 or 13. And, uh, but he was pretty well property before then. His master plan was to retire at the age of 50 and to devote the rest of his life to writing poetry, which he did. Uh, and that was well before he met uh, Mary Tanner Wells, who he, he married. So. Uh, that just enhanced it a little bit. Mm -hmm. sure. Anybody else? Edison? A matter of interest, uh, old Dan didn't plan uh, his mausoleum right to the uh, nth of an inch or so, because when the Green Mountain, when the uh, Scotney Mountain Green Granite sarcophagus was moved up there, it wouldn't fit through the door. Oh. <laughs> And it required uh, some doing with the uh, construction people. They had to take off the half of the top of the roof in order to lower the sarcophagus inside. Uh, I would imagine they would have had to have brought that up in pieces anyway. That would have been an awfully big thing to fall up there. As you can see, the roof is in three sections. and. Um, and that's quite surprising because he goes into detail about how he, uh, of course, in, inside the sarcophagus is the coffin made out of Florida cypress, which he actually laid in to be sure it fit him because he was about 250, 300 pounds. And uh, when he was put in there, all of the nails were soldered in. Um, he, and if, for those going up afterwards today, we'll get to see it, but there were two of these 200 pound bronze tablets. One is outside and the other is inside, all written in Latin except for the last sentence. And, you know, he you know, was meticulous about everything, but, but that does happen once in a while. <laughs> yeah. that, other, that's interesting. The other thing he didn't plan on was when he died. <laughs> Nobody ever does. <laughs> it was a motorcade that uh, attempted to move his body up there in the spring of the year 1934 and 
they got stuck <laughs> in the mud. Oh, oh. And so he ended up on a stone boat in his oaken <laughs> casket, which was made by a local uh, person here. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and Mr. Charles Gibson, who was a native here, had to use his uh, tractor with steel cleats to pull him up there. <laughs> that almost sounds like the, the, the well, and I'll give you the shortened version, but there's a short story about a, a prominent person born in Vermont, but didn't become prominent until he leaves Vermont. He gets a fortune, and in an old age he dies. He's brought back to his hometown. And he's to be buried in the family lot, which is up at the very top of this cemetery. And this was a case that, uh, you know, when they lay out the town, all the farming land, anything that can be farmed, is set aside for a farm. And they found this one piece of land that wasn't suitable for farming, so they said, let's put the cemetery there. And uh, anyway, it, it was in the spring of the year, late season snowstorm. They had a motorized hearse, and they couldn't get up the top of that hill. So they had to get a horse and a stone boat and uh, drew him right up through there. And uh, of course, uh, well, when you have more time, that uh, somehow he slipped off. His coffin slipped down and it uh, went sailing down to the center of town. And, uh, just a story, Mike. <laughs> when I'm not uh, portraying Dan Cady, I can tell you that in complete detail. But, uh, that kind of sounds like that story. Mary. Uh, uh, excuse me. Daniel Katie. Uh, Bob Carson was a uh, uh, artist over at uh, St. Gaudens for a no number of years. And then he settled in the area. And he was very interested in Daniel Katie. And so he did that relief of Daniel Katie. Uh, and uh, he had it. When he was working on it, he had a hard time because he could not make Daniel Katie's thumb go under his uh, waistcoat there. And he made it one way and he made it another. Bob Carson isn't here today, is he? No. I called him last year and he was very interested, but he, uh, he works, he's in uh, Springfield. And, uh, but he, couldn't, he could not do that thumb. Fast forward. Beryl Hinton and I were down in the Historical Society here every week for many years, and Franny Cady, and uh, uh, we went through diaries and letters and all kinds of things. And one time, Beryl was reading a uh, diary of a Mary uh, Waits, and Mary, the, as, as uh, Daniel has said, he, he was when he was a little boy. He, and when he was growing up, I guess, yeah. lived in the red brick house up here. And Mary Waite lived in the, uh, where the alpacas farm is. And she was probably about 19 years old. She was about to get married, and she had kept this little teeny diary with little teeny writing. And one day, one of the last pieces in that uh, little diary was little Danny Katie cut off his thumb. Oh. <laughs> and I've seen several photos of Dan Cady, and I haven't paid attention to whether he had all of his thumbs. I'm <laughs> <laughs> going to have to look. I can tell you one more little bit. Certainly. Certainly. A little bit off. But uh, when I was probably a teenager, 1934, 35, I'm not quite sure what year it was, but my grandfather. My grandmother died in 33, my grandfather died in 34, and my father died in 35, and I was married in 37. So in the, one day, when we went, my mother and I went down to the, my grandparents' home in Springfield, which was now the Hartness house, and I can remember being in the front hall, and this, this important man from, from uh, Weston was coming. His name was the Honorable John Barrett. And he was very tall and very handsome, and I have no idea what, why he came to visit at that time. But I, I, but I was there, and he, his claim to fame was that he was a consul from the United States to Siam. He, I also looked him up on Google, and he, he had uh, 
traveled all over the world as a reporter and also worked for the government uh, in, the, in many different places. So he was a, a very important part of the, I guess in, also it said he was the most important member of the Barrett family. But subsequently, I, I knew there was some connection with Daniel Cady. So I won't go into the, the whole details of it. But Daniel died in 34. And he'd been married, I think, since 13 to, uh, what's her name, Wells Tanner? Yes, Mary Wells. Mary, Mary yeah. And, and in 34, she married uh, John Barrett. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, 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 and then she died in 35, I think it was, and Jan Barrett died in 37. <laughs> but she was, she was much older. Now, I don't know about Dan, Dan, how much older she was from Dan Cady, but I know she was older, and I figured that one out. But she was a great deal older than John Barrett. And I, 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 think, I know that she was a very wealthy woman. <laughs> <laughs> so you can take it from there. <laughs> okay, we have one. Yes. Yes, uh, Adam, I never forget once that that used to be all, all open fields right there. Now it's woods right there. And I was walking up, right up over towards the water right there, and by God, sir, I stopped for a minute, got the binoculars out. There were two deer, crashed. They went right down through, went up a little ways longer. By God, there was a tail end of them, one there, by gosh. And I kept looking at him and looking at him. Just like that, somebody shot it and it came right there and dropped right there. And it was a big buck. And I saw the tail in and the guy come out and he says, By gosh, there, he says, I saw you and then I saw him and bang! <laughs> dropped the thing and then I got up a little closer by Daniel Katie, Ken, Katie's Miami. By guy, Jen, there was a doe right there just laying right there and she saw me. I was looking just like that. Boosh! Took right over into Davis Burke's over there. Jumped the stove off. <laughs> and I told Dad there, by gosh, there, my dad. And he says, do you know who the fellow was, Jen? I says, no. But he says, he was looking at me, and he looked at that fucking boy. It was a big, big full on it. <laughs> and he got it the same area of every other year he's seen buck right there. And he says, he got him right up by Daniel Cady's. I am up there, but it was coming over towards that way. Jack, it's a buck sanctuary up there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Peter. And somebody said I that. I think they, it's an annual reincarnation of Dave <laughs> Hey, Peter. And it's all posted up there right now. You and before that, and you could hunt. In Latin. Yeah. <laughs> 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 okay, so now I guess we'll turn it back over to Jenny, and we have some folks who are going to share some of their favorites. Thank you. Um, so thank you, Mr. I have to figure out I'm Adam. Adam Boyce for sharing, sharing your research and uh, your I didn't want to do the same thing twice. What I did last year was a little more wordy, so I figured I'd do a little more poetry this year. So if you didn't come last year, you missed out. <laughs> <laughs> and for also sharing, letting us ask you pertinent questions about your research and his life. And thank you also for the community members that were able to share star stories and fun anecdotes about um, Daniel Katie. Uh, so now, um, to summon the poetic spirit of Daniel Katie, it's become tradition <laughs> to wear this stovepipe hat and um, while they read their, their <coughs> selection, their poet, poetry selection. So we're going to start off, and the honors are going to be given to Mr. Edson Pierce. Last year, this went down over my ears. I don't know. <laughs> we haven't resized it. <laughs> anyway, it's great to be here. And I am to read one of his poems, Farming in Vermont. I've wondered all my life how tis a farmer gets along so well. He has so many things to buy and such a precious few to sell. His calling calls for such a snarl of tools, equipment, traps, and gear. 
I don't see how he saves enough to go to Boston every year. A legal gent can start in trade with nothing but an office cat. The town lot booster only needs a little desk room in his hat. But Mr. Farmer has to have an outfit, and that isn't all. That outfit has to stand the strain of summer, winter, spring, and fall. He even can't slip into town a day like this without a sleigh, a harness, blanket, whip, and lash, a lap robe, horse, and hank of hay, while other toys that help him do his work with neatness and dispatch are logging boots, a traverse sled, some blasting powder, and a match. Two heavy harnesses, an axe, a saw and saw buck, adds and bar, a hog hook and some candlesticks, a tackle block, and pot of tar, a suction pump, a skein of chains, two kettles of capacious brass, a barrel each for pork and beef, and soap and cider apple sass, <laughs> hose, cultivator, weeder, cart, a winnowing mill and Fairbank scales, a roller, cheese press, pung and plow, a hammer and a can of nails, a evaporator, holder, tubs, a sap yoke, pan and flail and churn, a spreader, tether, scythe and snaff, a grindstone and a boy to turn, a sprayer, sprinkler, wagon jack, a cant hook, shovel, stone bolt, sledge, a nest of measures, basket seven, a beetle and an iron wedge, a shotgun, fish pole, sickle, forks, a government report on soil, <laughs> a harrow, barrow, sheep shears, vice, some spavin cure and harness coil, oil. Three kinds of rakes, horse, bull, and hand, a cradle, sheller, woodchuck traps, a hay fork, planter, more drill, an entry pole, and hold back straps, a ladder lantern, saddle dog, an ox yoke, and a yoke of stags, a buggy gig and lumber rig, and last a span of working nags. No other business or profession can come within a hundred miles of such preparedness, and yet the buying farmer buys and smiles. He knows that when he fades away, the auction bill will spread his fame and show, although his name be Smith, that he had something to his name. <laughs> Um, so if she's not here, oh, I am next. Oh. So it's good. <laughs> you look good with a hat. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm reading the last of May in Vermont, being the first of June. Plant and time had already's here, and will soon be gone. Oh, and time will soon appear as the year rolls on. Soon, before we know it, most hay and days will dawn. See the farmer on his land doesn't look so glum. See him swing his broadcast hand, knows the seed will come. Earth is saying things to him, and he isn't dumb. Fog and rain and sun and air are a help in all. Whether it is a foul or fair, whether spring or fall, seems as though a hidden force, unaware, back his call. Happy farmer, happy days, waiting autumn's yield, doing what his conscience says in his little field. Happier he than hero dead, <coughs> born upon his shield. Hoeing time is pretty near. Scumble out the hose. Hay and time will soon be here, as the grinstone knows. Then will come the harvest home, then the winter snows. 
Ain't it great? Ain't it fine? How the seasons roll. Earth the regular melon mine under man's control. Hope nobody gains so much as to lose his soul. <laughs> quarters of your mail goes right from the box into the bin. <laughs> and apparently this is not a new phenomenon. This poem is called Overdoing It. I wish that I could get my bills, my monthly obligations for heat and light and power and things that cook and cool the rations for me and my relations. I wish that I could get those bills, although it would be surprising without their being rolled and wrapped in reams of advertising. <laughs> the dodgers that the gas folks mail would nearly set me raving, accepting that I use them up for cleaning shoes and shaving and other sorts of saving. You'd suppose the way they bid me by, their simmerers, plates, and heaters. My house was just an eating place for everlasting eaters. My telephone connection sends a regular publication advising how to set my sails to win their admiration and rise in worldly station. It tells me how to run my house, my office, and my stable, and says I need a stanchion phone upon the kitchen table. <laughs> I'm dodger poked and steered so much my wife begins to doubt me. Commercial friends block out my course and do their best to rout me. There's witchcraft all about me. Oh, could I have my bills unmixed with such unsought advising? Oh, could I live my life far off from high power advertising? <laughs> Please talk. Where have you been? There he is. <laughs> you pardon my attire. <laughs> so glad you made it. You are a bit casual. <laughs> I'm pleased to announce that the door to the mausoleum is open. <laughs> It took a sawzall and a saw and a oh. chisel and a crowbar. <laughs> it took a long oak tree to finally pry the door open. Oh, Did anything come out? out? <laughs> <laughs> no, inside it. I hope he didn't come out. He can't get out because inside is a gated door with slots oh. in it. The two heavy duty locks, the heavy, most heavy duty locks I've ever seen in my life. He is not coming out. <laughs> so I didn't think we were going to get time. in there. <laughs> no, no. It's good news. It's good news. Yep. Yeah. So you're welcome to go up and, and do it. Mm -hmm. Now, Edson explained that uh, they had to take the roof off to get him in. Now mm -hmm. I understand why. Because you couldn't turn it around once it got it in the door. It would fit the door, but it has to go 90 oh, degrees. Right. It, yeah. On display in there, you know the plaque that's outside? Mm -hmm. is the identical thing yep. inside. Oh, so it's there for sale. Anyways, moving right along to Daniel and Katie. Uh, the one I chose to talk about is the Vermont breakfast. <clears throat> now before I start, there's a couple of lines that I need to explain a little. And it goes, and, comma, lest I disremember. Instead of saying I forgot or I don't remember, <laughs> it's lest I disremember. <laughs> anyway, the, the title of this one by Daniel and Katie is... Uh, it must be a cholesterol wasn't a problem back in those days. <laughs> when you hear this thing, this is pure cholesterol. No doubt about it. <clears throat> the Vermont breakfast. When summer days speed up so fast that August bumps September, you need a breakfast that will last and less I disremember. 
there's nothing round the morning hour with which a man can grapple like good salt pork and plenty on it, enriched with good fried apple. It doesn't fade away so soon. Your stomach squirms with wanda. A saint can work right up to noon and not be sawn asunder. It beats them package foods a mile, that top shelf ten cents scrapple. Just hand me good old fried salt pork, enriched with good fried apple. Good solid pork assaulted down way back there last November. That sputters sweet and spatters brown, and less I disremember, them apples by the garden gate that had a reddish dapple. Yes, that's the kind of pork I mean, and that's the kind of apple. Just wipe them where your hand is flat, and slice them thin and slanting, and tip them in the spider fat, the while it's hot and panting. <laughs> Say, that's the kind of morning dish with which soul can grapple, good sweet salt pork and plenty on it, enriched with good fried apple. A meal that bids the spirit sing, the dish that saves September, and yes, that's and yet there's just one thing, of uh, one other thing, unless I disremember. A good cream gravy starts the stuff, a sliding past their frapple, and makes, the, makes that salt celestial pig and glorifies that apple. <laughs> Vermont breakfast. show your pretty shirt there. Yeah. <laughs> Say, it was fun to boil all day and extra fun to boil at night. Each time before we built the fire, the boys would take an iron bar, retrue the arch, reset the pan, and pry the kettle up to par. And then we'd ah yeah, and then we'd slather on the clay to make the thing combustion tight. And say, it was fun to boil all day and extra fun to boil all night. There'd be a backfire now and then. Most chimneys have to sneeze and cough. And there was set ones, more or less, of course, each time we syruped off. But wasn't that, well, wasn't that syrup good and sweet, not zoomy gray or sickly white? And one did, God, that is Beta. hard to read. Beta. I can read that better. <laughs> And wasn't it elegant to eat that syrup syruped off at night? We fired with hemlock, dry as bone, and it was floating sparks, no doubt. But always after every run, we scoured the pan and kettle out. Soft soap and sand, a Yankee pair, would make them both look pretty bright. And all us boys, we combed the hair before we went to work at night. However, wasn't no science plant, no prophylactic tub or plug, or ox or ass was round the place, or a liber, a listerated jug or mug. I wasn't able to find out what listerated was. But wasn't, but wasn't that syrup good and brown? It looked the part. It tasted right. I'd never seen a can in town like that we syruped off at night. A sugar house was just a shack shacked up side Briggs way, bit by bit. Said Parva after Estes how the preacher might have spoken. 
no zinc containers around it stood, no evaporator was in sight. But one that syrup, sweet and good, that syrup made at dead of night. <laughs> sent me to the, uh, the dictionary today, um, and, and I, I spent some time making notes, uh, because as much as I like textiles, uh, I, I don't know, as, as some of you do probably, that the particular names of, of linens and silks and such, um, but I, I left my notes set at the bottom of Bill Stilson's hill, so, <laughs> so uh, I'll do the best I can. Um, oh, this is a different edition. Oh, no. Is this the wrong one? You have, you have the one you had at your house? Oh, no, I left it there. Sorry. Perhaps I can... Hold on. There is another one over there. Is See, he was fortunate Gosh, enough to... Uh, fortunate enough to publish several editions, uh, which is rare for a poet these days. He also published uh, in, in newspapers, you know, the Boston, well, mm -hmm. air, area papers and, and as far as Boston. Um, we don't see that so much anymore, uh, unfortunately. Um, and I think he was a little conflicted as well uh, between being the country boy and the city boy. Um, it, it, there's a note in, in one of these editions about how so many of the poems were written in Italy, uh, the 20, I think, were, were written in, in, in England, and, and some in France, and some in Florida, and, uh, and some in, in, in Vermont. Uh, he, 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 so there was a certain conflict there. Um, yeah, the volume contains 170 pieces in all, with... Um, 107, isn't it? Well, it, yeah, did I, what did I say? 170. Right, one one hundred seven. You're right. Each uh, of the four in the rural rhymes of Vermont had exactly one hundred and seven um, pieces. He never called them poems; they were pieces. Huh. And actually, this one does not mention Italy and, and all, all the rest. But uh, yes, thank you. Fashion in Vermont. Okay, so I'll do I'll do my best with with the the, the so basically the, the big difference here is that he's comparing silky, gauzy, see-through, I imagine, uh, uh, clothing <coughs> versus the, 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 the Yankee tight cotton, I, I, I think, <laughs> burlap. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> fashion in Vermont. These strange mo-gab-gob modes of dress, we see this chiffron shapelessness, these lacy, crappy, gauzy styles, this net through which witter smiles, recall the days of better taste, when every lady wore a waist, the waist we used to call a basque, a trim as trim and neat as I could ask. It took a seamster quite a spell to build a basque and line it well. For first, the whale bones had to go inside the lining row on row. You can see the conflict here. <laughs> I see just how they used to look in Butterick's picture pattern book. An upside down Chianti flask. That's what it was, a stylish basque. The stitching held in every seam and made the wearer's form a dream. It buttoned up way up, oh yes, with 20 buttonholes, I guess. No taint it had of blouse or slack. It fitted perfect down the back. I hope to see air clothes of life a waist that fits on someone's wife. 
So out with Tool, Malines, Georgette, and voila, and all the veiling <coughs> set. Let wool and mohair help the cause with honest goods instead of gauze. <laughs> Come waist with whalebone well combined and skirt with paper cambry lined. Come them that used to cut and fit. <coughs> Come sewing woman, bring your kit and take the little hall recess for yarn and make a chalet dress. I want to see air doom shall crack a gown that fits the lady's back. <laughs> <laughs> that we have been able to come back two years in a row for the second annual Daniel Katie Day event.